The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 6, reading from verse 10 to verse 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We are still considering this most important and vital exhortation which the Apostle addresses here to these Ephesians. Now, we've been taking a comprehensive and a general view of the nature, the character, and the activity of these evil forces and powers which the Apostle here teaches us are arrayed against us as Christians. Uh, It's essential that we should uh, do so because, as he points out, if we are not aware of these powers, it just means that we are being defeated by them. That is why he here and uh, the scriptures in other places uh, take such trouble to enlighten us with regard to the whole character of the life in which we find ourselves. And therefore we have taken a view of the various manifestations and activities of these evil powers. Now, there's a very practical reason for doing all this, of course. And uh, that is that uh, this is, as we've been seeing, I think, the only explanation of the state of the world as it is this morning. So if we want to be intelligent in our understanding of the whole contemporary situation, we must lay hold upon this teaching. But uh, personally, also, it is important for us to realize this, because there are many things that happen to us as Christians, which we simply cannot understand if we are not aware of the nature of this conflict. There is the constant tendency, as we saw several Sunday mornings ago, uh, to uh, allow ourselves to be governed by physical states and conditions, moods, temperaments, feelings, and these are various ways in which the devil can attack us and come to us and rob us of our great salvation. Therefore, it is essential that uh, we should be clear uh, with regard to these forces that are set against us. Now, there is a sense in which it is true to say that uh, this is the great message, the great theme of the Bible. And what I'm anxious to do this morning is to give uh, some kind of uh, general summary of the great message of the Bible in that respect. One of our constant dangers, of course, always is uh, to uh, miss the wood because of the trees. We become so immersed in certain details of the biblical teaching that there is always a very real danger that we fail to remember the, the whole, the great general message, the one big theme. For the Bible, we must never forget is a book, really, which has only one message in it. Oh, it has all sorts of details, yes, but these are illustrations. These are the working out of the great central general principle. And I'm therefore suggesting this morning that what we really have in the Bible from beginning to end is an account of this conflict with these forces of evil, the devil, and these principalities and powers, the world rulers of this darkness, the spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And uh, it's very important that we should view the Bible as just the history, if you like, of that great conflict. Now, let's try and do that this morning. Let's take a bird's eye view of the message of the Bible. This seems to me to be the appropriate point to do that. We've been taking a general view of these forces that are set against us. Very well. Let's look at it now from the other standpoint, from the other aspect. And therefore, I would have to remind you again of what is, of course, the crucial 
matter in an understanding of human history and in the understanding of our individual experiences, and that is the historic fall of men. You go right back to the beginning. That's where this biblical outlook differs from everything else in the world this morning. You see, there you've got it. After the first two chapters of Genesis, which give you a, a brief summary of creation, of how everything that is has been brought into being, men included, then immediately it comes to this question of the fall, which you find in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. Now there at once, you see, we are told, indeed there's already a suggestion of it in the second chapter, uh, where you have uh, the story of creation stated the second time. It's the same thing as in Genesis 1. There are no two accounts of uh, creation as some people foolishly would believe. Uh, it's one account except this, that in the first chapter of Genesis you are given a description of the whole thing. But then in the second chapter, attention is concentrated on man, man himself. Because after all, man is the most important being in, 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 in the world. And so having indicated in chapter 2 that the business of the whole book is to be about man. You get that crucial event in the third chapter. The fall of men. The devil, the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world coming in. They were not the rulers of the darkness of this world at that point, but they came in. The devil himself came in and uh, faced men, God's uh, supreme creation and tempted him. And you remember the result, man fell. And the consequence of that is, as I was reminding you many Sundays ago, that uh, the world became the kingdom of Satan. Satan became the god of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And furthermore, this is the position. Everybody who is born into this world is born... A child of wrath. We are born, as it were, citizens of the kingdom of darkness, of the devil, of evil, and of Satan. Every one of us. Now, this is essential biblical teaching. The fall of men led to just that, that men became subservient to the devil. He became the slave of the devil. You remember this in the teaching of our Lord himself, where he turned to those unbelieving Jews and said, Ye are of your father the devil. And the works of your father ye will do. Now, of course, this cuts right across modern popular thinking. The world ridicules all this. And it is because it ridicules it, of course, that it is as it is. In behaving as it does, the world is proving the biblical teaching. It isn't aware of that. Why not? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. They can't think straightly. It is the devil's masterpiece to persuade men that they're emancipating themselves by not believing this kind of teaching, and thereby they become doubly the slaves of the devil. Very well, there it is. Man is thus by nature a child of wrath. He is a child of the devil. He belongs to the kingdom of darkness. And therefore that is our starting point in any consideration of man and the world and what's going to happen our own individual experiences. For we see at once, having examined the powers and the intelligence and the activities of these evil forces, surely it must have been obvious to us all that man is weak and helpless and indeed utterly hopeless. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, it isn't a matter of pitting ourselves and our intelligences against men and women like ourselves. It's these other forces that we've been looking at. With their tremendous power, their ability to do things in all these subtle forms and ways and manners that we have been investigating. And man, confronted by all this, is obviously defeated. The man's position by nature is quite hopeless. Now, if we are not agreed about that, of course we shall not believe the gospel. Here's the season of Advent, you see. Why did the Son of God ever come into this world? And there's only one answer. He had to come. He had to come if man was to be saved. 
Man could not save himself. Man, I say, the moment you realize these forces that are against him, he is in a completely hopeless condition. And the Bible says that he is. Now, of course, this is the point at which so many hate the Bible and hate the gospel. With all our ridiculous false optimism about man and development and evolution and so on, this, of course, is hateful to us. And yet, my dear friends, isn't the whole world proving all this at the present time, as I say? The Bible starts by telling us that, at the very beginning, that man has become the slave and the serf of the devil. He is mastered, he's controlled, he's conquered. And he really is in a parlous condition, face to face with this terrible power which is ruling over him. Now, doesn't the whole story of the human race prove this? Doesn't history prove it? Look at the story of history. Take secular history. Forget the Bible for a moment. Look at the whole story of secular history. What do you find? Well, it's nothing, is it, but this. The constant attempts of men to deal with his own problem. That's the meaning of all the civilizations that have come and have gone. But you see, that is their story. They've come, but they've gone. You cannot surely come to any conclusion as you read secular history, save that which uh, indicates that uh, the man moves in all his efforts to better his lot in circles. There's a rising, an achievement, and a falling. Yes, it's the rise and fall, always. Look at your great civilizations of the past. Egypt. China, Babylonia, India, and many another. They've come and they've Greece, they've achieved great things, yes, but they've all been followed by some kind of dark era, dark period. The knowledge seemed that was garnered has been lost and dissipated, and back they go again to some almost primitive condition. Think of how there was once a tremendous civilization in that part of the world that is engaging so much attention today, North Africa. What a mighty civilization there was there, Carthage, and all these other places that you can read about. That area where the great St. Augustine was once a bishop. Look at it now, look at it uh, for the last uh, uh, several centuries, many centuries. But there was once a thriving, a mighty civilization there. Down it's gone. Now, uh, isn't it time that we begin to look at history and call upon the world to do so? Isn't it time that the world stopped for a moment and examined its own story and began to ask the question, well, what's the matter? For, you see, history demonstrates this very clearly, that in spite of all the brilliant efforts of men to emancipate the human race, it has never succeeded. It always led to failure. And surely, we are living in an era today in which this ought to be painfully obvious. Don't you see the evident manifestations of decline on all hands? Here, I say, we are in an era when we are obviously on the curve going downwards again. Oh, how different from a hundred years ago. Look at all the optimism of the Victorians. How they were looking forward and singing. The golden era was coming. We don't sing like that. Of course we don't. We can't. It would be sheer folly for us to do so. Well, now, why is all this? What's the matter? And I'm saying that the answer is what we are told here. It is the only explanation. Something bedevils all the efforts of men. There's something dogging his footsteps. What is it? Well, the Bible tells us from the beginning, the devil, the wiles of the devil, principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Very well. I sum it up by saying this. This is the fundamental conclusion of the Bible. Man is defeated. He's up against a power in comparison with which he's a pygmy. He's an utter weakling. He's nothing. These unseen forces with their abilities and powers and control have overwhelmed him. Right. There's the starting point. Now then, the question we ask is, is all hopeless therefore? Is there nothing to be done? Well, of course, the existence of a church such as this is the answer. There is a hope. But there is only one. 
And if we've understood what we've been saying about these powers, we surely must see that there's only one. And it isn't one that arises from men. It's nothing human. No, no, it's our message that comes to us from above. There is only one hope. What is it? The hope revealed in the Bible. Man has done everything he can. He's excelled himself periodically. He's striven, he's stood on tiptoes. He's attempted to scale the heights. He's always been thrown back in utter defeat. There is only one hope. It is the hope revealed in the Bible, and in other words, it is what we may well call the history of redemption. Now then, that's the great message of the Bible. Now, we've got to get it into that setting. We can't understand it unless we do. The Bible takes all this for granted as its basis, having given us its introduction. That's why a man who doesn't constantly go back to the first three chapters of Genesis is, apart from anything else, just a fool. He's an intellectual fool because he's forgetting the fundamental postulate. Very well. Now then, what is this history of redemption? What does the Bible tell us? Let me put it like this in a number of propositions to you. The first is this, that redemption, salvation, must always be thought of in this particular way and manner, in this context. Negatively, we must not think of our redemption and salvation in such a subjective manner. Because our whole curse today is that we are subjective. We start with men, we end with men, and the trouble, that's why the man is in such trouble. But we mustn't do that. The danger is, I say, to think of redemption and salvation simply in terms of what's happening to me. How can I be forgiven? How can I get rid of this sin? How can I be happy? How can I get this, that, or the... That's our approach. But it's a very false approach according to the Bible. We've got to look at it in this other context. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our fundamental trouble is that we are in the grip of these other powers. We are in, under the dominion of sin. We are in the kingdom of the devil. That's what the Bible says. So whatever I may feel like is of no value to me unless I'm sure that I'm out of that kingdom. What I need is not comfort. The devil can give me comfort. He's got many of them. Look how he's comforting people today. Well, I know it doesn't last very long, but while you're under the influence of the drug or the drink, you're feeling very wonderful and happy. The devil can make you feel very comfortable and happy. Everything's all right. Never had it so good. But the point is you're still in the prison. So we mustn't look at these things subjectively. We mustn't always be just consulting our feelings. The fundamental need of man is to be delivered from the dominion of Satan. He's got to be taken out of the kingdom of darkness, whatever he may feel like. Now, that the, the Bible puts the history of redemption into that context. And at a time like this, such as Advent, it is absolutely vital that we should do so. We can't understand Advent unless we think in this particular man manner. Here, as it were, is the problem. Man created by God has been taken hold of by the devil. He, the devil has become his god, his master, his ruler. What happens? Well, here is the answer. The second principle is that God is concerned. Now, here is our whole starting point. As we see what we are wrestling against, what we are confronted by, here is the great message of the Bible. God is concerned. The world doesn't know that this morning. So the world is looking to conferences, looking to organizations, looking to statesmen, looking to men. It's always been doing so. But nothing comes of it, as I've been telling you. Not that I'm saying that they shouldn't be doing that. Of course they should. I'm going to show you in a moment it's God who's ordained that, but there's no fundamental hope there. The only hope is that God himself is concerned about this situation. Why? Well, he tells us why he's concerned. And I know nothing more comforting than this thought this morning. God is concerned in this matter because his own glory is involved. His own name is involved. His very honor is involved. What do you mean, says someone? Well, what I mean is this. That this world, after all, is God's will. He made it. He made man. 
the almighty, glorious God. He made it all. And that is why I say he's concerned about its condition. You see, the way to be comforted is to start with God always, not with yourself and what you need or want. Stand back for a moment and see that the almighty eternal God is involved in this situation because it is his handiwork that the devil has spoiled. And because God is God and because he is glorious and will not give his glory to another and because he is over all and from everlasting to everlasting I say it with reverence he cannot leave this world as it is. And blessed be his name he hasn't left it. My friends this is the way to start. We've seen the powers against us. Very well let's realize that God is involved. We are not left to ourselves. There's nothing more discouraging than to think that we are left to ourselves and we are having to trust the psychology and things like that to deliver us. God help us. We are utterly hopeless if that were the position, but it isn't. God is involved because of his honor and his glory. But not only that, of course. The ultimate object of the devil is not man, it's God. Who are we? We are but the pawns. We are nothing. The devil isn't interested in us as such. He's only concerned about us because through us he attacks God. Yes, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. These powers are against us, yes, but still more important. And I say it's the greatest comfort I know this morning. They're ultimately not against me, but against God. The Almighty himself. So God is involved. God is concerned. We are not left to ourselves. Very well. There's the great starting point in the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible is this. It is the account of what God has done and is going to do. About men confronting the devil and the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the whole message of the Bible. Keep your eye on it. Never lose it. As you read your Bible, keep on reminding yourself of this. This particular detail you're interested in, oh, it's only a part of that great business. Oh, keep your eye on the campaign. Don't get involved in the local skirmishes. It's essential in any warfare. Strategy comes before tactics. Don't get lost in your tactics. Keep your eye on the great strategy. That's the business of the Bible. Now then, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that God has got a great plan and a great purpose, a great plan of campaign which has led to his action and activity. What is this? Well, go back again to the beginning. And you will find that God began to act and to put his plan into operation the moment that man fell. You see, it's all there in Genesis 3. Man fell, was conscious of shame and of guilt, but God came down. And God spoke to men and addressed him. Now, the very fact that God came down to men after he'd sinned is, again, I say, one of the most comforting and consoling facts. It meant this. That God hadn't decided not to destroy men in the world. That's the amazing thing, isn't it? You would have thought that God either would have turned his back upon men and had said, well, very well, if you're such a fool... Get on with it and destroy yourself. Or else, in his righteous wrath and indignation, he might have looked down and said, man is unworthy of fellowship and communion. Let me blot him out. Let's end it all. But he didn't. And again, let us ask the question, why didn't he? And again, we can be certain of the answer. I say again, it is because if God had done either of those two things, he would have been defeated by the devil. The devil would have laughed in the face of God and said, Yes, there's the man you created in your own image. And you looked at him and saw that he was good in his universe. But look at him now. I've got him. Or if God had destroyed men, the devil would have said, Yes, you made a man in your own image. And you said it was very wonderful and very good. But now you've had to destroy him. Your own handiwork. It's no good. It's just got to be brushed out of existence. So you see, my dear friends... We mustn't think of this salvation of ours in our little subjective 
petty manner, let's realize this, that the great almighty God must act, I say. He's defending his own character, his own almightiness, his own name, his own glory. So he came down to men. And he began to speak to him in the garden. And what did he do? Well, he told him, he gave him a great promise. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. He said, because of what you've done, there's going to be a warfare now between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Life is going to be a trial, trouble, warfare, skirmish, briars, thorns, diseases, all these things are coming in. But nevertheless, he said, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. There's the hope. God has got a plan. He's got a great purpose. That's one of these fundamental postulates that God has intervened. God is coming in. God's going to do. God is going to redeem his universe. Now then, the question is, how has he done that? And here we come to a, a very vital and important uh, division in what God has done about the world as it is under the authority and the power of the devil. All that God does, of course, is done in grace. We deserve nothing. It is the grace of God that made him came, come down into the garden and speak as he did and give the promise. It is all of the grace of God. Yes, but now you've got to divide the grace of God in this matter into two great sections. The first is what is called common grace. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean this. Here, man in his folly has listened to the devil and he's fallen and has become the slave of the devil and all, in a sense, has gone wrong. Very well. Now, God has done two main things. The first is this common grace. This means God's activity in controlling the results of the fall. And indeed in controlling the activities of the devil and these principalities and powers as they affect men. Common grace. What do you mean, says somebody? Well, I'll tell you what I mean. You can divide your common grace into two main sections again. First of all, the institution of government. I don't want to keep you with this this morning, but there it is. The powers that be are ordained of God. Romans 13, 1, etc. You'll find it likewise described in the Old Testament. Government is not a human invention. It isn't men who had a bright idea one day and decided to set up government. It's God who ordained that. God divided up the nations, the bounds of the nations. He, he, he circumscribed their territories, delimited their territories, and uh, he decided that they must have governors and rulers and magistrates and all these things. It is God who ordained all that. What for? Oh, well, to keep the manifestations of evil within bounds. God, as the first and foremost, controls the effect of the fall. He keeps it within limits, and he does so primarily by means of government and law and order. That is why, you see, we as Christians are exhorted by Paul to pay respect to kings and governments and authorities and powers and magistrates. We are never to be lawless as Christians. Christians are to obey the law because it is God's ordinance. We are not obeying them, says Paul. We are obeying the ordinance of God. Very well. There's the first. But there's another aspect, and that is what we may describe as general culture. Now I invite you sometime today or as soon as you can to read in the book of Genesis from chapter 4 to chapter 11. And there you will see the origin and the beginning of culture, general culture. How a man was expert at playing instruments of music, another at building cities, architecture. All these things come in, these various gifts that God has given to mankind. Now, God has given them all. You read there and you'll find it all described. This is all a part of common grace. What's it for? Well, you see, it is to prevent the evil outworkings of the fall. Intelligence, ability, art, music, culture, all these things. What are they for? Well, ultimately, they have this great function that they are to limit the manifestations of evil. They are to remind man of God, even in his fallen condition. 
there to get him to see that God is the giver of all these gifts and that therefore through them they must worship him. These are the manifestations of common grace. But this is the thing I'm emphasizing. They have all come into being because man uh, is the victim of the devil and the principalities and powers. You see, these, this evil power has taken charge of the world. Well, now God is answering partly by common grace. He is putting a limit. See, that's the thing that's being so tragically forgotten today. See, we don't believe in punishment any longer. That's because we don't know about the devil and the principalities and powers. We believe in being kind to everybody, and we are, we are positive, we say, in our approach, and we are seeing the results of it, of course. No, no, God says that evil has got to be controlled, it's got to be punished. The magistrate beareth not the sword in vain. Of course, we don't like that, but it's interesting to look at the people who don't, isn't it? Who are they? Jews, infidels, godless men. They are the leaders in all these movements against what the Bible teaches. Of course, they don't believe these things. But God knowing the forces against men, realizes that evil has got to be controlled, it's got to be punished. Men must be disciplined. Men must bear the consequences. Otherwise, life would become chaotic. We are beginning to see that. It's happened many times before. When mankind has finally turned from God, you get chaos, you get anarchy, you get every man becoming a law to himself. No respect to any government or any kind of discipline. We are already seeing this. But it is, you see, due to the failure to understand the biblical teaching about common grace. Well, the Bible tells us that even in spite of all this that God did, there was nothing but failure. And failure on such a scale that God decided to punish that ancient world in a very drastic manner by destroying it in the flood, apart from eight persons, not complete. He kept something of the original, and through this he's going to do something fresh. That's the message which you have essentially in those first chapters of Genesis. I leave it at that. All I'm concerned to emphasize is this, that you can't understand that story, as you can't understand the world as it is this morning, except you see these evil forces and powers working and manipulating, and God acting on the other side. Common grace. But I hurry to the second division, which is special grace. Now, this is the thing, this is the main theme of the Bible. It merely hints at the other, it just shows it us that it's there, but the real message is special grace. What do you mean, says someone? Oh, what I mean is this, that God at the very beginning shows us quite clearly that he is dividing the human race into two sections. One, those who are going to be controlled in their evil. Two, those who are going to be delivered and redeemed from the evil. Who are these? Well, the first is Cain and the second is Abel. Abel is not saved, he is simply controlled. Abel is delivered. Immediately the division. Abel, the man of God, the saved, Cain, the unredeemed, the one who is merely kept in order by the common grace, etc. Now, here is the key to the whole story. It's the key to the understanding of the Bible. It's the key to the understanding of the whole story of history. All along you get these two divisions. The world today is divided into these two groups. The Christians, the non-Christians, the redeemed, the lost. And there it starts with Abel and Cain. Then you watch this line of Abel. Keep your eye on the patriarchs. These are the people who are in the line of Abel. These are the people whom God is setting apart for himself. Here are the men who belong to the kingdom that God is bringing in as against the kingdom of the devil. He's taking them out of that and putting them into this. Patriarchs. And then the most important point, of course, is found in the three sons of Noah after the flood. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, you remember. But the one to watch is Shem. This is God's line. These are the people of God. Shem. Follow the line of Shem. And here God is separating. He is leaving the other, controlling them, but leaving them ultimately. Here is the line of the redeemed, the new kingdom, God's people, the line of Shem. And, of course, that brings you very quickly to the call of Abraham. 
And here God is doing a most remarkable thing. He is forming a new nation for himself. He is taking this one man and he is turning him into a nation for himself. He says, this is my people. Now, how can you understand the Bible if you don't lay hold on this point? But why is he doing this? Well, these are the people he is saving from the devil in his kingdom. That's the answer. This is God's special working in grace, his special grace, the call of Abram, the formation of the nation and the kingdom. Then I'm simply picking out the big things for us to have a bird's eye view of it. He then gives the law to this nation. And the function of the law was dual in a sense. First and foremost, it was again to remind them of God and to keep them living the life that God wants them to live. It was to control them. But secondly, it was a kind of prophecy of what God was going to do in a still bigger manner in some age that was to come. All your burnt offerings and sacrifices, what are they for? Well, they're covering sin for the time being, but they're pointing to the coming one, the deliverer, the sacrifice, the Lamb of God. God's plan. He's delivering men. This is the purpose. Fight against the devil and the principalities and powers, and God is doing it through this people. And thus he puts his stamp upon them and separates them and surrounds them by his law to show that they are his people. That is, in its essence, the great story of the Old Testament. But there is one other type of activity that I just want to put to your notice this morning, and it's one, again, that we are so constantly neglecting. The ministry of angels. Now, we've been talking a lot about the devil and the principalities and powers, and we have said that these are fallen angels. These are spiritual entities that have fallen. They followed the devil in his rebellion and they're down. They're under the wrath of God. We are confronted by them, these unseen spiritual powers. My friends, have you ever realized, as you should have done, that there are also spiritual entities and powers and spirits on the other side? And that God has been using them to help men, to help him to stand and to fight. It's all in the Old Testament. You see it there, but you see it partly also in the New. But it's especially in the Old Testament. What do you mean, says someone? Well, I mean this. Here is men as it were still left to himself. The incarnation has not yet happened. God speaks to men. He gives his law. He tells him his purpose. But still men is weak and is fighting these terrible powers. God comes to his aid through the ministry of angels. And the moment you think of the angels, you are reminded of the spiritual nature of this conflict. The evil na angels, the good angels, what is their ministry? Let me hurriedly summarize it for you in these words. The angels are obviously very concerned about men and his salvation. The Apostle Peter in his first epistle, first chapter, verse 12, says this, that the angels in heaven were stooping down to look into this salvation. He says the prophets were prophesying concerning the coming salvation. And the angels, he says, were stooping down, trying to look into it. What is it? Oh, they want to see how God's plan is going to be worked out. They're interested in salvation. Yes, says our Lord, you remember in Luke 15, in his three parables about salvation, there is joy amongst the angels of God or of heaven over every sinner that repenteth. These angels are interested in man. They've seen him defeated. They've seen the devil controlling. They're concerned. These good servants of God, they're looking down. They're interested and they rejoice at every single conversion. And indeed, Paul tells us in the 10th verse of the third chapter of this epistle to the Ephesians, that it is through the church that God is going to show to these principalities and powers in the heavenly places the manifold character of his own great and glorious wisdom. Very well. They're interested. It's a wonderful thought, this. What are these powers? Well, all I know is this, that some of them are called cherubim. When man sinned and was turned out of the garden, God placed the cherubim and the flaming sword guarding the entrance back. 
Some of his servants, the angels, the cherubim, some of the highest grades. There are many grades. There were grades on this other side. There are grades on God's side. Cherubim, seraphim. Read of them in Isaiah 6. Then read about the archangel. Read about an archangel whose name is Michael, whom we read of in Daniel 10. And there he is defending the children of Israel, fighting for them against the prince of Persia, guarding them, a kind of guardian angel for Israel, Michael. You'll read of him again in Jude's epistle. Then think of the archangel Gabriel, who was sent, you remember, to tell Mary of the birth of her son. God sent this emissary. Angels. Oh, but I haven't time. What are they? Are they not all ministering spirits sent to help and to function for the heirs of salvation? That's what the angels are. We read this morning. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? The angels of God, the hosts of God in camp. We sang in our hymn, Around the Dwellings of the Just. And you read your Old Testament and you'll find it. Read of the angels that visited Abraham more than once and helped him at points of crisis. Go back and read in Genesis 19 of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there you'll read that Lot was so influenced by the surroundings and his wife and family that they would have been destroyed. But God sent angels and they put their hands upon him and forced him out. The angels of God delivering the remnant, however unworthy, Lot at Sodom. Don't we all remember Jacob at Peniel having his marvelous dream and seeing the ladder sent down from heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending? Jacob, at this moment of crisis, helped by the angels. Look at him being told to return to his own land again by an angel. Look at him at Mahanaim. Here he is, he's coming back. He's got to meet his brother Esau. And he's alarmed, he's terrified. What shall he do? And an angel came and ministered to him. Read about it. Do you remember the call of Moses? It was an angel that first appeared in that burning bush. This vital turning point in the history of the children of Israel. It was an angel that was used. How was the law given? It was mediated through angels, says Paul, in the epistle to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 19. Hebrews 2, 2 says the same thing, given by angels. Then do you remember that terrible period of the judges in the history of the nation? When they'd got down almost to the dregs, God raises judges. Do you remember a man called Gideon? Do you remember how he was called? It was through the ministration of angels. Samson, how did he come? Again, read the story of how an angel appeared to his mother and to his father. Look at Elijah escaping from Ahab and Jezebel. After the mighty scene on Mount Carmel, he's escaping. And there he is, he's gone 40 days and he's weary, he's tired. He is sitting under a juniper tree, resting, and he would have starved. An angel came and ministered to him. Look at Daniel. Look at the three men in the fiery burning furnace. Look at the angel that was with them. Look at Daniel in the den of the lions. There was yet another with him, an angel. It's always the same. And this, you know, is not confined to the Old Testament. You get it in the New. It was an angel, we are told, that set Peter and Paul at liberty from prison in Acts 5. It was an angel that told Philip to go down and eventually meet that Ethiopian eunuch. It was an angel that appeared to Cornelius. And do you remember the story of Peter lying in prison and how he was to be brought forth the next morning to be put to death by King Herod? There he is, lying asleep, bound with chains to the two soldiers, and an angel smote him upon his side and woke him up and took him out. An angel. And when Paul was in that shipwrecked vessel in the Adriatic, and when everything seemed to be lost, it was an angel of God that appeared to him in the night and told him, Be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life but of the ship. It is always this ministry of angels. And why? Well, because of these other angels that are against us, the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places, and they'll follow us to the end. Yes, 
even in death, but it's all right. Our Lord teaches in his parable of Dives and Lazarus that when this good godly man Lazarus died, he was born of angels into Abraham's bosom. Death is not something lonely to the Christian. There is the ministry of angels, these unseen powers. They carried him into Abraham's bosom. And we are told that when the end of the world will come, it will be certain angels who will be sent out with sickles to reap the vengeance and the wrath of God. You notice that I've left out a very important section about angels. I've done so deliberately. I'm hoping to start with that next Sunday morning. I was simply anxious to give a kind of bird's eye view of what God has done about us as we are confronting these powers. Who are we? We are nothing. We are hopeless. God has come in. What's he done? Common grace, special grace. And let's not forget the ministry of angels. Our Lord teaches that in heaven, the angels do behold the face of our Father which is in heaven. He says, don't you despise these little ones, children. Every one of them is a guardian angel. Don't despise them in heaven. Their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. These are all ministering spirits sent to serve and to minister to us who are the heirs of salvation. My dear friends, do we remember this? Do we realize this? When you feel lonely and isolated, remember that they are there. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But thank God there are other principalities and powers. There are other spiritual forces, the angels of God, the hosts of God that are encamping around the dwellings of the just. God is thus caring for us. But oh, this isn't all. This is glorious. It carried them through the old dispensation. But it wasn't enough. There was more to come. And so the whole of the Old Testament is looking forward to the coming one, the glorious Messiah. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.